Good morning. Good morning. If that, uh, if that felt like more than two verses, it was. Uh, this is, yeah, verses 15 to 21 is the gospel reading for this morning. Um, but thank you, Dee, for, for reading that. It wasn't her fault. That's what it said on the screen. Uh, also, I noticed in the, in the announcement that Irvin gave, um, Fred, did he say you can run several miles in one sitting? I think, I, I, saw, I, saw, I saw some faces light up when he said that. Um, you can run several miles in one sitting. Uh, but it, it's, it's a good lesson, I guess, in how, how closely we're paying attention to, to things that we hear. So how many of you were here for Luke's message last Sabbath? Hopefully most of you, yeah, okay. I wonder if I put you on the spot if you remembered what uh, Luke's message was last night, or last week. Uh, the mystical body was his message, that the, we, the church, are called to participate in the life of God by becoming members of Christ's risen body, the mystical body of the church. And if you remember a couple weeks before that, for several weeks now, we've been emphasizing the role of Jesus as both human and divine, the bridge between humanity and divinity, right? You remember my message a few weeks ago about the shepherd and the gate, that Jesus is the shepherd who leads us by his human example, but also the gate. He is himself the doorway, our access to God. So this has been our theme for several weeks now. Jesus, both God and human, is our access to the Father. But today we have to press the question, one step further, which is if Jesus, in his divinity and his humanity, is what makes our access to the Father possible, we have to ask the question of what makes our access to the Son possible? How do we get connected to Jesus? If it's through Jesus that we are connected with the Father, well then how are we connected to Jesus? The answer, of course, is the Holy Spirit. And there are a couple passages that come to mind that you might want to jot down. Ephesians 2.18, Paul says, Through the Son, we have access in the Spirit to the Father. You see the relationship? Through the Son, we have access in the Spirit to the Father. And he says something similar in Galatians 4.6. God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. This is why I always try to tell people, God is the gospel. What do I mean by that? God is the gospel. That if we know what God is, if we know who God is, that is the good news. The good news is who God is. So when we call God the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is itself a summary of the whole plan of salvation. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is itself an encapsulation of the entire gospel. Let me put it to you this way. God put his spirit in our hearts to unite us to his Son so that we can call God our Father. Does that make sense? God put his spirit in our hearts to unite us to his Son so that we too can call God our Father. Why do you think Jesus at the end of Matthew's gospel, tells us that when we baptize disciples, we baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Why? Because if someone is becoming a Christian, if someone is entering the church, if they affirm the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, then they've affirmed the whole, the whole story. They've affirmed everything there is to affirm. God has put his Spirit in our hearts to unite us to his Son, that we too can call God, Father. With that as a bit of context, we'll get into the gospel reading for this morning. First, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. A couple of quick remarks. First, that term advocate. Some translations will say what? What's another word that you might see sometimes? Comforter, right? We know it as comforter. How do you get comforter or advocate out of the same word? These are kind of two different things. Uh, in Greek, 
and I'm sure many of you know this as well, as well the term is paraclete. And we've heard, we use that as kind of technical term sometimes. The Holy Spirit is the paraclete. But what does a paraclete mean? Why is it translated in these different ways? A paraclete literally means someone who is there beside you, someone who is there with you, right? So that's why you can understand it to mean a comforter, someone who's sort of by your side, but it can also mean in a technical sense, it can also be used to refer to like an attorney, someone who stands by your side, right? Someone who has your, is on your side, an advocate, a comforter, a paraclete, right? Someone who's with you. But it says here, another advocate, another paraclete, Jesus says, I will ask the Father and he will send you another paraclete. If the Holy Spirit is another paraclete, then that means we already had one, right? If, if the Spirit is another one. So who's the first paraclete? Jesus, right? Jesus is God with us. But he's letting us know, as he says consistently throughout the Gospel of John, I'm leaving. But I won't leave you orphaned, as we'll see later, I will send you another paraclete, another one to be with you, to mediate God's presence to you. Also, just real briefly, uh, this first verse here, verse 14, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. I think we've all seen how this is used as a proof text for Sabbath keeping, things like that. But what are the commandments of God when Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments? What are the commandments in Jesus' mind? T two, two commandments, right? right. In, in the Synoptic Gospels, he says, love God, love your neighbor. In John's Gospel, he says, I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. That's the, those are the commandments, right? Love, love, love. On love hangs all of the law. So if you love me, you'll love me, you'll love God, you'll love your neighbor, right? Simple message. But then, look carefully at this. There's something very strange going on. Hopefully something that you might find a little upsetting. Anybody see anything upsetting about this? If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. You see, Jesus is setting up a kind of condition that love and obedience is in some sense a condition of receiving the Holy Spirit. If you do this, then I will do this, right? If you love me, you'll keep my commandments, and I will send you another comforter. But the reason why this is, feels kind of backwards maybe to us is that the Bible also makes it pretty clear that we can't love God, we can't obey God, unless we have already received the Holy Spirit. So how can love and obedience be a condition to receiving the Spirit if the Spirit is a condition to obeying? Does that make sense? The Bible says we love because he first loved us. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. You see, so you see the problem there. It's like, it's like if you had a big debt and you came to me and you said, can I borrow some money? And I said, sure, pay off your debt, and then I'll loan you the money. It's, it's backwards thinking, right? I need the money in order to pay off the debt. We need the Holy Spirit in order to obey. So what's going on here? I think what we see here is the same thing that we see in many of Jesus' parables, which is God always gives you a little bit to work with. Think of the parable of the talents, right? Each of the servants gets a little bit. And then depending on what they do with that is what creates the conditions of whether or not they're going to really receive the full thing. Does that make sense? So God has given each one of us a little seed of his spirit. This is what theologians call prevenient grace, the grace that God extends to all people. God has given us all a little bit but then we need to cooperate. We have that little seed, but we have to nurture it. We have to water it. We have to tend to it. So if you do nothing with the little bit that God has given you, 
If you don't love and obey, if you don't cooperate with the Spirit that is already in you, then you can't receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. But if you take that little bit that you have and exercise it like a muscle, right? If you work with what you have, it will become stronger. So here's a lesson for you, both as individuals and as a church. Do you want the Holy Spirit? Do you want the Spirit to transform your life? Do you want the Spirit to be at work in this community, in this congregation? Then what's the, what's the condition? We have to use what we have. We have to make good with what we've been given. The Holy Spirit is always a gift, right? We learned that this morning in the story. The Holy Spirit is always a gift. We can't do anything to earn it. But when it is given to us, we exercise. We make use of it. And in so doing, our capacity for love grows. Jesus says, this is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither neither sees him nor knows him. Now here again, we have another one of these kind of paradoxes. Seems kind of circular reasoning. It says, the world can't receive him, the spirit of truth, because they don't know him. But he's the spirit of truth. It's, it's only through the Holy Spirit that you can know the truth. So how can Jesus say that you can't receive the spirit of truth unless you know him? but you can't know him unless you have the spirit of truth. You see, it's the same principle. That the world who can't receive him is the world that is not making use of the light that they have. The world that is not following the path that God has set before them. The love of the world, the Bible says, crowds out love for God. 1 John 2.15, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Our pursuit of worldly things crowds out our love for God. Now let's be clear about this idea of worldly things. Worldly things are not in and of themselves bad things, okay? That has to be clarified. Something that is secular, and the word secular means worldly, is not intrinsically sinful, right? To be secular, to be worldly, is not in and of itself bad. The problem is, is that if that's where our love is, meaning if that's where our goal is, if that's what we're attached to, then that is what crowds out our capacity for a love of God. And I think, when I, so when I think about this passage, when I think about worldliness that, that blocks our way, I think about how we are just attached to things, Right? And I know I've mentioned this before, so I'm kind of adding myself, but having a phone with you, right? We're all attached to our phones, and I think about how even when you get in line uh, for something, right? Maybe I go to Chipotle, and there's a long line, and so before I get to order, I'm just standing there. But what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to check my email, or I'm going to read something, or I'm going to play a game on my phone, because I can't go a few minutes without some kind of entertainment, without some kind of distraction, But think about what happens when we're doing that. We are constantly crowding our minds, constantly occupying ourselves, constantly being busy, constantly multitasking. So what's happening there? Are are we not, by constantly filling up our lives with stuff, with just junk? Again, not necessarily bad things, but just, just junk. We fill up our lives and we crowd out the voice of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus goes on and says, in contrast to the world who doesn't know the Spirit, you know him. You know him because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I'm coming to you. Now, this term orphaned, very specific language that Jesus is using here. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. Jesus says he will send us the Holy Spirit so that we will not be orphaned, 
precisely because the Holy Spirit is referred to in Scripture as the spirit of adoption, the spirit of adoption. That's why we're not left as orphans. So this is what Paul says, Romans 8. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, this is Paul speaking, when we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. You see what's happening? We call God Father only because it's the Spirit of God in us that is calling out to God as Father. Now, I have to clarify something because, again, to go way back several weeks, no, just a few weeks ago, uh, I preached a message about the Holy Spirit. Some of you might remember that. And I got a little bit of feedback that Uh, Fortunately, I have the chance to clarify now because I I forget sometimes that we use the term children of God in a way that is a little bit different than how the Bible uses it, and it's worth clarifying. So oftentimes in conversation, we talk about how everyone is a child of God, right? You've heard that, that's how we talk about it. I remember after 9-11, people say, oh, but you know, Osama bin Laden, he's a child of God too. And what do you mean by that? Uh, of course, the intentions are right. What we're saying is, is that this is someone who is beloved by God. This is someone who we ought to love, right? We ought to love everyone. God loves everyone. That's what we mean by that. But when we then go to the Bible with that kind of lens of everyone's a child of God, we actually miss something really important, which is that for the apostles, from the perspective of the New Testament, to become a child of God is the big deal. That's the good news, is precisely that we are not children of God naturally, but that we become children of God by adoption. John begins his gospel by saying, to all who received Christ, who believed in his name, he gave power to become the children of God. And he'll say again in his letter, and you know this from the little song, behold what manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called, what? Children of God, right? So our status as children of God is a gift. It's not something that we are naturally. Now, think about this. You may not have ever put two and two together like this. But the Bible, as we know, refers to Jesus as God's only begotten son, right? Jesus is God's only son. Can we affirm that? But then we also say that we're children of God. Uh, so in God's eyes, we're a bunch of girls. Is that, <laughs> is that the idea? Um, no, see, the idea is that we are children of God only because we are participating in the only Son of God, right? We, through the Holy Spirit, are made members of his body so that we too can call God our Father. Not directly, but through Jesus. That's why, by the way, we we, we always say, in Jesus' name. Uh, This isn't some kind of magical formula. The idea is, is that when we address God, we address God from within Jesus. That's how we can speak to God as Father. Because we are in Christ. I hope this this is making some sense, yeah? In a little while, the world will no longer see me but you will see me. Because I live, you will live. Why is it that we see Christ, but the world doesn't? It's not that we see something invisible, right? It's that we see things for what they are. So when Christ says, you, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Where do you see Christ? Would you believe me if I told you that Christ was here today? Yeah, probably. If I said that Christ was here today visibly, you might hesitate. But that's what Jesus is saying here, is that Christ is here with us physically, visibly, literally. But where? Where in the room do you see Jesus visibly? 
sitting next to you. You see? This is the point, is that it, when we, insofar as we receive the Holy Spirit, we become Christ's body. And that's not a metaphor. That's not a joke. It's not an analogy. We become children of God so that Jesus is here present with you in the people around you. Now, if only we believed that, right? How different would we act? If I told you that Jesus was sitting up here in the front row, how many of you would want to take the time to come and greet him after the service or invite him to your home, right? We would be doing those types of things if you said that Jesus was here in the front row. But Jesus is here. And it's in our love for our neighbor, our love for the people around us, that we show our love for Jesus. You know, the slogan that's on the front of our bulletin, to love and serve one another and to love and serve the world. That's our motto at this church. Pastor Mike developed that for us. This has been his vision. And people have often asked him, and I've seen this, people will say, oh, but what about love of God, right? You said, love one another, love the world, but where's love for God? And what's Mike's response always? That love of God is love of neighbor, right? God says, if you want to love me, you love people around you, right? Love of God is not some kind of just private, inner, spiritual, devotional thing. Love of God is concrete in our love for each other. That's why the Bible says, those who say, I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are what? Liars. Liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Finally then, Jesus says, on that day you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. On that day. On that day. On which day? On the day that you receive the Spirit, right? In the day in which your mind is opened, your mind is illuminated, then you will know when you receive the Spirit of truth. You will know these three things. Okay, remember these three things. Christ is in the Father. You are in Christ, and Christ is in you. Christ is in the Father. You are in Christ, and Christ is in you. What does it mean to say Christ is in the Father? This is what we've been saying the last several weeks. Jesus is divine. Jesus says, I and my Father are one. So here is Jesus, divine. But he comes down to be God with us. So he says, I am in you and you are in me. How is Christ in us? He's already said it in this passage, through the Spirit. So if you want to think about it in terms of those uh, Russian stacking dolls, you know what I'm talking about, right? That's, I mean, that, that's what's going on here, right? The Spirit is in you. You are in Christ, and Christ is in the Father. And that's why understanding Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is so crucial. This is the whole thing, right? These are not just names and honorifics that we throw around. To say that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is so crucial because if God is simply God out there beyond us, then God just becomes this kind of impenetrable, unattainable thing. But it's precisely because God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that God is a relationship. So when we say that we have a relationship with God, what we're saying more precisely is that we are entering into God who himself is a relationship. God is the relationship of Father and Son with the Spirit as their shared and mutual life and love so that when we receive the Holy Spirit, we are being caught into this divine life. And then, and then what does that look like for us? Well, this is the message of the apostles, that if you receive the Holy Spirit, if you walk according to the Spirit, if you nurture that gift of the Spirit that is inside of you, what do you experience? Love, joy, peace, patience, all of those things, right? The fruit of the Spirit. 
is what happens if you nurture that gift of God that's inside of you. You become sanctified. Sanctified, right, literally means holy-fied, made holy. And that's why it's called the Holy Spirit, is because it's the Holy Spirit that makes you holy. It's the Holy Spirit that makes you a member of God's family. If Jesus is God humanized, right? Jesus is God made human. What are you when you receive the Holy Spirit but humanity, as it were, divinized? Peter says, the promises of God are that you might become partakers, participants in the divine nature. You have a human nature, right? We talk about that all the time. Oh, I'm so lousy, but it's just my human nature. But the Bible says through the Holy Spirit, you become like Jesus, not only having a human nature, but a divine nature. That's the miracle. That's the good news. That's the gospel, that we become participants in the life of God. So do you want this intimacy with God? Do you want this experience of the joy of eternal life, the peace that passes understanding? There's one simple thing that's the, the key to all of it. Jesus says, they who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. Love. Love is the key to it all. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And if you want more, if you want to experience the fullness of the divine life, then the instructions are simple. Follow the Spirit. Nurture the Spirit. Grow in the Spirit. And your life will continue to be transformed. You continue to grow. As you grow in your love for God, God will draw nearer to you. John says, God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Amen.